if you have a copy of God's Holy Word, I would ask that you turn to the epistle of 1 Peter. Today we'll be in verses 10 to 12 of chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. Then we read, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels long to look. This is the word of the Lord, beloved. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we seek your divine aid again today that the mysteries of your word that originate in heaven and have been witnessed by the angels take hold of our hearts and minds here upon the earth. We ask that you grant us not only the right knowing of your word, but we also ask an increase in wisdom to live out the truth of your word in our lives. O God who dwells in light or unapproachable, our God who is holy, 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 our God who is full of mercy, love, and glory, we who have been called to salvation for Christ ask that you do a mighty work again of salvation in the lives of our unsaved children, whether young or old, O oh God, we pray to you and we pray for all those that we love and know in this world that are not yet saved unto Christ. We pray for this same gospel message to reach them, Father. Father, for the preaching of the word today, we ask that you grant in your kindness to both the preacher and the hearer the truth of your word given for our great benefit. We ask that through your inspired word that we, who love Christ, would be conformed to his image more and more. We pray these things in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Well, salvation is continuing to be the main theme of our passage, where Peter had mentioned our heavenly inheritance. He's talking about our salvation. We were to understand the significance of the inheritance when it came to these Jewish converts to Christ. These ones had been promised land, if you remember. And to the day, some folks are holding to that promise. And it came, uh, that that the promised land, it came from a people who, let's just face it, could not and did not ever fulfill their side of the Mosaic Covenant. And therefore, they have found themselves to be a people who have, for the large part, lost an inheritance only to be the object of God's mercy still and given a greater inheritance, one that was being kept for them by the power of God in heaven. Pardon me. Peter gives us today four key points in these three verses. They all relate to salvation. In that salvation, first we will see is prophesied through the prophets. Salvation comes to us by way of the sufferings, plural, the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Salvation, he says it this way, is given to us, given to you or them and to us. And that salvation is given to us to the wonder of the angels. Prophesied through the prophets, comes to the sufferings of Christ, given to us to the wonder of the angels. Let's take a look at that first section there. Again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Now, Peter is making a connection here for them, one that they're familiar with, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the question we should answer is, on what basis is he doing this? Why is he making this connection? And I think it's important that we get our head around that and understand it's a vital to our understanding of this passage. Um, there are some who believe that perhaps for the Gentiles, you know, us, that God began his revelation for us at Matthew chapter 1. But that's simply not the case. That All of this is given to us. Now I've lost my place. There we go. 
He gave it through the prophets, his word, and later through the apostles. As one of those apostles, the apostle Paul described for us in Ephesians 2 verse 11, this idea of those who are far off and those who are near. The Gentiles were those who were far off from the, the Hebrew God and the Hebrew uh, law that God had given. And those who were near were the Hebrew people. However, national Israel in Paul's day, and of course the day of Peter as well, is suffering. They're suffering under Roman oppression. And many began to fear what would happen, the coming wars. And so under persecution they've fled. It was spiritual Israel that had converted to Christ along with Gentile converts to Christ, these believers who would be made into the one holy church of God. And of that church, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 19 through 21, So then, you are no longer strangers. He's talking to the Gentiles. No longer aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of, here it is, the apostles and the prophets. Paul ties it together there as well. Christ Jesus himself being, well, it's a good name, the cornerstone. That's a good name, right, brothers and sisters? The cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Notice that the foundation is laid by the apostles and prior to that, the prophets. It was these same prophets that Peter is having in mind here as he's speaking to these Jewish converts. To answer our earlier question, why Peter is appealed to the prophets, we, I think we should turn to, maybe a bit, the Old Testament prophets, right? That's why we have the reading today, Daniel 7, and so we'll, we'll look at one or two of them. Uh, Daniel 7, what we're seeing here is a pre-incarnate image of Christ. A pre-incarnate image of Christ who is shown to be one as like the Son of Man. We're reading apocalyptic imagery, end times visions that are maybe difficult to understand at times and truly would not have understand in full, even by the prophets who bore witness to them. In that vision, Daniel looked and saw one called the Ancient of Days. This term, Ancient of Days, is often used of the Father, God the Father. Daniel 7, verse 9. Daniel 7, verse uh, 9, 13, and 22. But as you read through the text, there's no doubt that this is pointing to Jesus the Christ, the, the God-man, the one like the Son of Man, the one who has given all dominion and glory and a kingdom from all nations and peoples. And the prophets, they only know in part what, what they're given. They only know in part what the fullness of God's word was given to them. But the angels, keep in mind, the angels are bearing witness to the word of God going out to the prophets. And they're observing the power of God's proclamations. They've longed to bear witness in seeing the things of God come to their completion in Christ's kingdom. So as Daniel's vision continued, it went on to show us in chapter 8, it will go on to show you desecration, world powers, the fallenness of the world, uh, uh, demonic powers. But there's also a restoration of all things to a rightful state for these Hebrew people. That, that, and, and that's what Daniel's thinking about. And, and this vision was so shocking to Daniel that it shook the man to his core. He was terrified by the visions that he saw as he wondered about the impending judgments that he was seeing coming upon the world and the calamities and the final judgment of all things. And Daniel did as only he knew to do. He turned to the God of heaven and he prayed for his people. He prayed for his people. In 1 Peter, we're, we're seeing that prayer in part being answered. And so I want to I ask, because I wrote this just a few minutes ago, this part. It wasn't in my sermon, but it just seems right to me that right there, look at the answer of a prayer over centuries. We're not the prophets, but we have the words of the prophets given to us. And we too must teach this word of God to our loved ones because it's prophetic to their souls. We must then do as Daniel did. We must pray for our people. We must pray for our people and believe that God will see this through in their lives. In 1 Peter, we're seeing some of Daniel's own people now having turned to the one like the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. We see great salvation of God coming to a people that were wayward in a way that Daniel could not have understood. 
even maybe even in, oh, just such a fraction of what he would have known in his day but he knew it to be a grace and mercy of God that Peter said has said that the prophets who prophesied about this grace is given to you and he's talking to these believers and he may as well be speaking to us and while Daniel was not alone in the prophecy about Messiah I'd like to draw our attention if I could to the to the New Testament revelation again that uh, Pastor Gary read earlier just two verses 12 and 13 of Revelation 1 then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstand the one like the son of man clothed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest this is the vision given to John by the same God man who is the one like the son of man in Daniel the angels have been blessed they're witnessing the power of God's proclaimed word the power to then not only say it but to fulfill his word they are observing this from a heavenly seat and they are witnessing the coming of the Son to make the only way for salvation. They've already witnessed it. This is a grace given to them. And I think that if you were an angel, if you could imagine yourself being an angel observing these things, you'd probably be one joyful angel to see your God and His power and His Word and the power to carry out His Word. Wisdom and power as God would bring salvation to mankind. And you got to see it front seat. This is the joy of the angels. The grace of God was revealed in the Old Covenant, but the grace of God is fulfilled in the New Covenant. This is the salvation that Peter has in mind, and it was foretold to the prophets, who were given the imagery to see the man from heaven. The prophets knew that whatever this salvation was, whatever form it would take, this Messiah would have to suffer. There would be sufferings among the Messiah. Let's talk about the sufferings of Christ. Salvation and the sufferings of Christ. It said that in verse 11 that they did inquire carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. There's a pattern here. The prophesied Messiah beginning really all the way back to Genesis 3.15. All the way back. And with the coming of Christ will come the sufferings. And finally from those sufferings, there's, a, there's a, a, another side of the sufferings coming out of it, the subsequent glories. And we, we share in that. We're meant to share in that. Sproul writes of this verse, he said, Peter is saying to these believers, this is not a novel idea. He did not make it up. It's not a appear on the scene just out of nowhere. He said his teaching of Jesus is what the prophets of old spoke of when God put in their mouths the promise of the future redemption. They looked into it. That's what they did. They searched carefully and made inquiries. They knew that these things were going to happen, but they did not know when. They knew that the Christ would suffer and out of the sufferings, glories would follow. With the prophets, they could only see in part what we see so clearly, really, on the other side of redemptive history. We have a much clearer lens to look through, I believe. <coughs> Though the law greatly obscured their view, they had genuine hope in the Messiah. And we share that hope. They looked forward, and us who are looking back to the Christ, the suffering servant Christ. Let's consult even more just a little bit of the literature from the Old Testament. I think about how Jesus presents himself. The suffering servant, if we turn to the Psalms, would be Psalm 22 and Psalm 23 and Psalm 24. Think about this. All pointing in David's mind to the one called Messiah. Jesus himself reveals for us that he is the focus of these psalms that were spoken prophetically from David. He reveals that he was the focus of the Good Shepherd of Psalm 23. We know that he uttered those terrifying words upon the cross that were spoken in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These are the words of Christ. And, and we know that having secured the victory through his suffering then... We see victory on the other side of that in Psalm 24 that he alone is the one with pure hands, clean hands and a pure heart. He alone is the one who can ascend the holy hill of God. 
of that suffering servant in Psalm 22. The, the Jewish Midrash writings have, have connected this for centuries. Psalm 22 to Isaiah 53. The step they just don't want to take is that Jesus is that Messiah. They just don't want to take that step. But this is what Isaiah tells us, 53 verses 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Again, we see this order given by Peter was first Christ's coming, foretold in these ways through the prophetic writings, and second, his incarnate presence and actual suffering in the body, and thirdly, the subsequent glories that, of course, point to his resurrection and salvation that comes to us by way of his resurrection power. But it also goes further. It comes to the judgment of all things. There's actually glory for God in that. And those things haven't happened yet. In other words, to these Jewish believers... Peter means for them to know, he is the Messiah. You can have no doubt. You've believed rightly in him. And that's important. That's the message to these converts to Christ. Rejoice because his foretold one has come and accomplished his Father's will. Salvation is here. Now the Hebrew people had suffered through centuries. Ruled by other nations, made to be at best a vassal state of more powerful uh, nations such as Egypt and Rome and Greece and others, Babylon at another time. Time and time again, and because of their suffering and the word given through the prophets, they longed for the one called Messiah. Even the Samaritan woman at the well was hoping, oh, the Messiah is coming. He's coming. And he's going to make it all right when he gets here. And people knew about the Messiah coming. Peter reminded them that the Messiah was to suffer on their behalf. He reminded them of the way of the glory with Christ is through suffering. And Jesus taught us as much when he walked on the earth. In Matthew 16, 24 to 26, we read of this idea of the cross. Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? To follow Jesus is to invite suffering in this world for Christ. The Lord in that brief passage gives us three commands about this. Each of them are to be obeyed. The first was deny yourself. And, and we, we might wonder, well, what things do I have to deny to be denying myself, to be a follower, or to be a follower of Jesus? And the answer is pretty far-reaching and broad, actually. It reaches pretty deep into our lives. But generally speaking, the main idea is that your life is to be given to Christ. That you see it is His, and therefore your life is to the church of Christ and His plan for what He's doing in His church and in His kingdom. Others will order their lives completely after different causes in the world without Christ. But the Christian, our life is to be ordered to the agenda of the Lord. The second command is to take up your cross. I don't recommend that one. It weighs about 150 pounds. You get your, get your own cross. Do you know that you have a cross? You have your own cross to carry. It has your name on it. He said, take up your cross. You have a cross, beloved. You're to bear the cross. You're meant to carry it throughout your life. And the, the cross is representative of the most heinous type of death that Rome could bring to people. It represents death. Therefore, it is a metaphor. You are to die to yourself. It's meant to bolster the previous command to deny yourself to the point of dying to yourself. And then, he said, once you're there, then you're going to get after the work for me in this life. You're to live for Christ. And we see this in the third command that follows. We die to ourselves. We are called to live for Christ. To follow after him and his cause wherever that may lead us. 
How will we hope to follow Christ if we are unwilling to suffer for Christ? To pick up our cross and to live for His causes. You know, not all suffering that we endure is for the cause of Christ. Sadly, and I can think of my own life, in fact, probably the safest thing I can do is think of my own life. Doing stupid things is not suffering for Christ. It's just stupid. And if we suffer for stupidity, we're suffering for the sake of stupidity, but not for Christ. That's not what we're called to do. That's not the cross. That's just suffering for stupidity. Now, imagine church. God has gifted each and every believer that has ever lived. And these gifts are meant to be used in service to the church and the cause of Christ. We must think of ourselves in light of this. How will we account to God, to the Lord, for having been blessed with this salvation, having been gifted by the Holy Spirit for service, but in the end, many will decide by their life that their life is better suited for their pleasures and others can carry their cross. We'll just kind of applaud them and say goodbye. You're doing a good job. Oh, the church must be after the things of Christ. Think with eternity in mind, I urge you, beloved. Ask yourself, is my life truly about Jesus Christ? Is it? Do my money, my energy, my time reflect a life given to Christ or not? And I think of, as I've discussed this issue with people, just personal conversations over the years, the, the, the end question I give them is, what will be your legacy in this life? What, what is the legacy you hope for in this life? And uh, sometimes people will say, well, I hope to, you know, build a really big business. Well, there's nothing wrong with a big business. That's fine. But is that the legacy of your life? To have a, a big business and to pass on wealth to your children and grandchildren? For some people, that's the legacy they're hoping for. They're hoping for. <coughs> Pardon me. Thank you, Circle K. Fresh cup every time. <laughs> um, as we get older, now we don't, we don't always think of life this way. People, there are people who die young for many reasons. But as we get older, we know that time is drawing near. And we, we should think of our life. What is the legacy of my life? Will you, in an old age, if the Lord allows you to live, uh, uh, like my grandmother lived in 93, she thought they, they thought she would die by 60-something. She had a heart problem. And she lived very old, you know, a very long life. Will you be satisfied with your life looking back with that legacy? We could have gained the whole world. We could sleep in expensive beds and opulent homes. But unless I will say to the church that life is given to Christ, if when death approaches, there's little peace for people. But should the life and our life be ordered of the things of Jesus Christ, you're going to see something happen in your life. Your legacy will look different. You're going to see your legacy in the fruit of the Spirit bearing itself out in your children and your grandchildren and all the beloved that you've touched along the way and aided in their walk with Jesus Christ. There is satisfaction in that, beloved. We who believe upon Christ are to leave a legacy of faith. And we'll have satisfaction and peace as we do that. These things capture the subsequent glories that we're talking about. This is not only our salvation, but how we live from that moment forward through the rest of whatever is left in our lives. It's not the end of our glory, but there are subsequent glories we're to have even now, even in, in part now, but in the fullness of the age to come. And only who, those who believe upon Christ are going to share in that great abundance. These things are given to believing ones only. In this case, Peter's writing to this specific group, these believing Jewish converts to Christ. Salvation was given to them, and salvation is given to us. That's this next point, verse 12. It says, It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. 
To them, or the them in the passage is referring back to the prophets. The greatest benefits of the prophets were not given to themselves or even in their age. It wasn't. It really is given to us. God kept as a remnant, I'm sorry, it, the, the benefits is to the generations that came after the life, death, and resurrection of Christ in the fullness of glory. After these things occurred, the apostles are finally able to teach and preach the good news of the gospel. I will say this, through the rising and the falling of the Hebrew people, a nation that is assembled by the hand of God, they didn't assemble themselves, they were kept as a remnant to fulfill the promised seed of Christ. That this letter, had it been written, let's say directly to the Gentiles, that that, that was the one that went to the Ephesian church, or the, the Galatian church, or the Colossian. I, I don't know that they would have readily understood all that was happening here. This is written in a very Hebrew context. We must think as a Hebrew person who had the prophets, a Hebrew person who had an inheritance, but it seems lost. But they are also the same Hebrew people who had another legacy, that of killing the Messiah. That's part of their legacy too. The prophets were Hebrew prophets. We have to think this way. The Messiah was Jewish. Hmm? Hey, The Apostle Peter is Jewish. And he has reminded them that the revelation of God throughout the Old Covenant given by the prophets has found its destination in the salvation of Christ Jesus given to these believe in Jews. All to the glory of God who spoke through the prophets. God's view is not for just the Hebrew people only. We, we've learned this that is from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation that would come to believe upon Jesus Christ. And the angels are witnessing all of this happen. They get the front view of it all. The prophets have indeed served that generation in part, but all generations of faith that have followed Jew and Gentile alike. And so Peter continues, said, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Now the Holy Spirit is sent with a, with a purpose. The drawing and regenerating of the soul and the sanctifying and ongoing work of, the, of an ongoing testimony of Jesus Christ in the life of the believers. But he's not sent to everybody. Not everybody's regenerated in that sense. Sent to those whom the Father has given to the Son. Even for us in the present day in this passage, we learn that the prophets who lived under the law of God have a, indeed, through the Spirit, a present ministry even now to us in the New Covenant. They have ministered to these Jewish converts to Christ and even now these words of Peter are ministering to us. And this is one reason why we might disagree with some who say the Old Testament isn't relevant for the church. Brothers and sisters, these words are deeply relevant. Every word of them is relevant for the church today. They minister to us as any other part of the Bible. God has revealed to them a, por a part in time and in the fullness of time to the others, us. I'm so grateful for the steadfastness of faith that Peter has called these believing Jewish converts to, these sisters and brothers of ours who suffered for their faith in Christ, who listened to the wise counsel of Peter for our great benefit. It was written down by the affairs, written down such affairs in the Holy Scriptures, carried along by God the Holy Spirit under inspiration. This is what John Calvin says of this passage. For as the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, having a testimony from the law and the prophets, so also the glory of Christ, of which the Spirit testified formerly, is now openly proclaimed. That's what's happening here among them. And at the same time, he hence proves the certainty of the gospel, because it contains nothing but what had been long ago testified by the Spirit of God. And where was the testimony given? First through the prophets, and then it has come to the apostles, and now it has burst upon the hearts and minds of each and every believer in Christ. What an amazing and wondrous truth then Peter has communicated to them and to us. Even today, think about this, many Jewish children, not all, but many Jewish children memorized the first five books of the Bible. They memorized Torah. They had recited it from their earliest age. They're meant to memorize the whole thing. Yeah, we should try that. I think it would work good well for us, right? <laughs> 
Yet in doing so, in their memorizing, and for all of their knowing of what we call this part of the Old Testament, these Jewish peoples have been dispersed. And they remained not only an outcast from their inherited lands, but they remained, just as the Jewish people in general, they remained spiritually blindness to the fullness of meaning of the prophets and what they had written until the Holy Spirit testified to some of them, the ones Peter is writing to now, upon their hearts. This is exactly, Jesus Christ is exactly what national Israel needs today. No less than a drawing of the Holy Spirit unto Christ will do. There's just simply no other way of salvation for them. No parallel destination for them. In Christ with this holy church. Therefore these prophets were not serving themselves. Instead serving them through the things announced to them by the preachers of the gospel. As should there be any doubt of the authority of the gospel, Peter has appealed to three times the Holy Spirit. In verse 2, 11, and now 12. This third time making reference to the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's telling him, the authority of this gospel does not originate in men, nor do the apostles grant it authority. Instead, the gospel originates in heaven with God, and the delivery of the of the delivery of the gospel is proliferated by God the Holy Spirit through Christ's chosen apostles. They go out with the authority then of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when Peter shares this gospel with them and they convert, and suddenly that whole Old Testament and prophets comes into focus, I believe, just like many of us, suddenly everything is different in their life. They have Christ. These believing Jewish converts were going to need to rely upon that testimony and that authority because Peter's authority would simply not do as, as wonderful as Peter would be. He had to open their minds to God's wisdom over time because the trials they faced were not simply just that they were put into a foreign land, as difficult as that would be. I mean, we could imagine you pick up and you move to modern day Turkey and go, okay, live here now. It's a challenge, all right? More is happening there. They are residing in pockets of Jewish communities. And not all of them are convinced, in fact, many of them aren't, that Jesus is the Christ. These ones reject Christ, as many of the Jewish people do in the present day. And that caused even further division in their community. Therefore, their small Jewish communities that reside in what we call modern-day Turkey, they were further divided, those who had converted to Christ and those who were opposed to Jesus as the Messiah. Jewish brother against Jewish brother, Jewish neighbor against Jewish neighbor in an outcast society. That's tough. That's a tough situation to be in. Their community of faith would have been limited. And so Peter, I think, perfect timing, Peter, in writing them this word of encouragement. It greatly reminded them of the great word of God regarding the salvation of his people has taken hold of them and was given by God's authority under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Only with this understanding can they accept that salvation that had been foretold by the prophets and now given to them through the sufferings of Christ and as a move of the Holy Spirit upon them. That's the only way they can accept this. All of these great events, in all of them, there has always been a cosmic audience observing every bit of it. The things of salvation that are given to us, the great covenant plan of redemption of God unfolding in time, are but wondrous things to behold for the angels. And Peter has mentioned them, and so I think we should spend a minute understanding what does he mean fully by this. Salvation given to men, but to the wonder of the angels. Peter concluded this thought. He said that these, these are the things which angels long to look. And you might wonder. In the opening of this greeting, of this letter, Peter has all three members of the Trinity in view, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is no independent operating of the Son that's not working all together in perfect unity with the Father and the Spirit. Perfect harmony. Peter shows the Father's role in, for, in, in this foreknowledge and the sending of the Son and the Son in the coming forth in human form and His blood being spilt for the sins of many. And of the Holy Spirit, we see there in verse 2, the Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son in the great and ongoing work of sanctification. 
And the angels are watching God, the Father, Son, and the Spirit with wonder and amazement. The works of God are what they behold. Now Jesus gives us a little bit of insight about the angels in Luke 15 verses 8 through 10. Now anyone who's ever misplaced an item of great value uh, can understand the parable, but he mentions the angels here, if you would. Luke 15. For what woman, having ten silver coins, of course women are going to lose the coin, not men. What man, having, no, what women having lost the coin, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now I recall a time when Donna and I had moved to Georgia from the other south, funny south, Southern California, okay? She's from L.A. and I'm from San Diego. And we rented a furnished home over in Martinez. That's always funny to me to say Martinez because, you know, we say Martinez, right? That's funny to me. <laughs> and one day Donna looked down and her, her diamond that I had given her 17 years earlier was just missing. It had fallen off the mount. It was gone. When did you last see it? I, I don't know. Maybe yesterday. I, I don't know. And, and we began searching the home. We were grieved to think that that could be lost because it was given in love. So we looked and then I, I started, I thought, well, I'll start by the master bed and I, I shined a light and just almost immediately a little glimmer of light and I looked and, I, and there it was, this diamond. <laughs> And we rejoiced. We didn't call our friends, though. We rejoiced. Uh, and, and then we took this diamond and the ring, and we had a new mount made that was better than the old one. And, uh, well, it still stays there. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, as wonderful as that was for us, the angels in heaven are not rejoicing over coins and lost diamonds that are found. They are rejoicing over each and every soul that comes to faith in Jesus Christ, that turns towards God, and they rejoice for the salvation of the lost, because in it they see the power and the wisdom and the love of God's perfection all come to fruition right in front of them. His word declared His power to keep His people and to save them and to carry them on to eternity. This is what they're rejoicing in. These are the things what the angels long to look into. And the, the verb in our passage is very similar to this experience that Jesus has given us. Let me see if I can say this right. Perkipsai. Perkipsai. It means to stoop down, to get close and take a look, like a, like a macro shot on a camera kind of thing. To get down low, just like I did looking for the diamond. To get down low. For the angels, this is their view from heaven. And they, they look closer into the wonder of God who is in the middle of the affairs of men as they come to salvation in Christ. They're not jealous for us, the angels, because we have an altogether different nature than they, but they love to see the glory of God on display, and they do so to their great joy. And all these things, the angels long to look, but they're not done looking, brothers and sisters. There's many more who must be saved. Sometimes people say, I just wish the Lord would come today. And I, I get the sentiment, and I think you do too. But, I, but think about that. Lord, come in your right time. Come in your perfect hour. Because there are many who need to be saved. Many that the angels will long to look to to see their salvation. But God is not done with the fullness of time yet for this world. There's much more to happen in the fullness of time. There is something called the day of the Lord approaching. And it comes. The marriage supper of the Lamb. The angels look forward to the, not just the salvation, but they also look forward to the perfect justice of God as it falls to the righteous and the unrighteous. The books are going to be opened. The sheep of Christ in the Lamb's book of life will go to glory, to the angels' great joy. And the angels will not mourn for those who are not written in the Lamb's book of life. They will sing praises to God for His perfect justice 
executed upon the wicked. Regarding the salvation we now possess, beloved, the prophets prophesied about it, the sufferings of Christ assured it, the Holy Spirit carried the gospel message along to us, and the angels themselves are bearing witness to it. They long to look in these wonders of God. Let me give a, another brief application, then we'll close. What are you longing to look into, beloved? We are not the angels. We don't have their view, their perspective on things. But we have our perspective. We can't see from heaven as they do, but we can look at the wonders of God as one who looks to heaven. Let me set the question in the context of our passage and imagine how these dispersed Jewish believers might have answered the question, what are you longing to look into, beloved? As they suffer various trials in their faith, they suffer with Christ. And so Peter has reminded them, in, and in doing so, he's reminding us that our longings are to be heavenly minded. That's what we're to long to look into. We're to long to look into heaven, not fixed upon land or wealth or any other worldly pursuits. And there are fine things we can pursue in this world. They're just not our destiny. And we have to keep that in mind. We have families. We have plans. We have goals, education, careers, marriages, and homes. We have children, and, and, and some of you will have grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren, and the daily workings of our lives that we live in. But at the same time, we know that something's wrong, and we, we groan a bit in the world, not only for our own failures, but we see the world around us and the current state of the nation and, and the larger world. On many fronts, it's troubling. Not only are we witnessing men and women in our culture debasing themselves, but they encourage and applaud others to do so and partake in wickedness. They openly call good things bad, and evil things they call good. Our nation today parades debauchery. They exchange the truth of a lie, the truth of God for a lie, and they worship a, an idolatrous God, a little G God that is invented in their minds. This is the culture we reside in. A and you would imagine from a culture, what type of clergy might we have that rises up from a culture like that? We have clergy who have no fear of the Lord. And they take Nicaea and they replace it with Sparkle Creed. Real thing. No fear of the Lord. Instead, they are trusting in their ceremonies, their repetitious ideas of an inclusive God that allows evil to be called good. We must wonder at times, in a world like this, what is our future in such a place? But we should wonder, as the dispersed Jewish converts must have wondered in a foreign land, why do I feel like I don't belong here sometimes? I mean, if you, if you ever wonder if you belong here on New Year's Eve, watch the New Year's Eve tele, you know, television shows. You'll know quickly. You have, you're like, I don't relate to any of this. I feel completely lost in whatever's on the TV. In fact, I just turn it off. I feel completely lost from this. Philippians 3.20 teaches us that though we presently reside on the earth, our citizenship is in another place. It's being kept for us in heaven. So we ought to feel a little disconnected from a culture. But don't let us lose hope. This is where Peter means to fix our minds. He says, in, in your life, present day, let's, let's look at the promise of heaven. Let that carry us through whatever strangeness this world has. And as we live our days upon the earth, we'll feel all the more strange to the things of the world. We're going to feel that even more and more. But we have work to do, beloved. Carry that cross. Yet we are to hope in Christ who keeps us, even when we suffer and we rejoice in the Spirit who sanctifies us and we rejoice in the God of our salvation. Where is your mind fixed, beloved? You must keep these truths and wonder of God in mind as you go throughout this life. And I believe this is exactly what Peter intends for these believers to do. Fix their minds upon heaven. In fact, next week when we look at the uh, uh, verses uh, 13 and on, He's going to tell them, set your hope to heaven. That's where he's leading them. 
And that's where our hope needs to be fixed. Amen. Let's pray.